Hey guys, welcome. I'm Danny Ratliff here with Richard Rosso with RIA Advisors. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Good topic, a timely topic, especially for uh, people in my household as we have little ones and trying to raise them up in the right way and make sure they get a really good understanding as far as how do you raise money smart kids. So we're going to talk about some practical things that you guys can put into practice and play. So even though this doesn't pertain to you per se, maybe it pertains to uh, you know grandchildren or you have somebody who um, this was certainly can benefit from something like this. So we try to cover a wide range of topics. We're going to get into quite a bit today, uh, focus specifically on this, just practical ways to raise financially responsible and really money intuitive kids. I think this is uh, so important. There's a big lack of education surrounding this. So we want to cover this in, in some detail here today. Rich has put together a great presentation, um, and I think you guys are going to get a lot out of this. So we are Clarity Financial doing business as RIA Advisors, a registered investment advisor with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Do keep in mind, this is purely educational, no per se investment recommendations or something so specific, but I think you will get a lot from this today. So Rich, let's jump right in. Where, you know, where do we get started with something like this? Well, something before we get started, something you brought up, Danny, is um, you've got more and more also grandparents raising children, uh, whether their their children are working and they spend a lot of time. So grandparents, you might have a lot more time to actually do some of this, too, uh, with your grandkids. So they might listen to you versus their parents. I know that was the same. That was it in my house. Grandma could deliver information to me and mom could and it could be the same. But when grandma delivered it, it was different. So, so we appreciate y'all being on. So the thing is, and Danny, you know this too, your children are observing what you're doing with money, your relationship. They're forging their, their own money script, which is subconscious. Like it or not, they're doing it with your help. So these are unconscious, transgenerational beliefs about money. They develop in childhood and they drive adult behaviors until you identify them. So we all have these money scripts. And this is Brad, um, doctors Brad and Ted Klomp who created these, this moniker. And there are four categories, money avoidance, right? And we all probably know people that fit into these categories. Or like, for example, if you go to um, Real Investment Advice or actually RAA Advisors, you'll see our financial survival guide. You could take the first level test of this called wealth potential. And then I send out the money script test. We all have sort of our fingers in all of these, but there are dominant money scripts that we have. And money avoidance is money is evil. Rich people are greedy. I hate you all. Uh, I, was, I was reading a story about um, this woman who's an actress and she lives in New York. She makes all this money, but she lives in this like 300 square foot apartment with, with, with uh, literally roaches running across the ceiling because she hates money so much right so she gives it all away money worship money is more money i have all my problems will be solved it doesn't matter all the money right and then also money status i got to have all the you know the self so forth to net worth right i place a p premium on all the brands you know i got to be better than the neighbors it really bothers me if they're they own a new bmw and then money vigilance alert, watchful, concerned about financial health. So um, it's interesting. You should take these two just to see where you fall. So where you fall and the actions you exhibit, your kids or grandkids are picking up on it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the stats that we see over and over again, that there's not enough sitting across the kitchen room table and discussing money and kids just don't pick up on it any longer. I've shared a lot of stories with my kids on you know, things that they've just, you know, and I think we do a really good job about having these discussions, but they don't perceive it the same way we do, especially because you're not feeling it and touching it like you used to. Things are yeah. bought on Amazon or things are bought, you know, on a whim and stuff shows up and they're like, they don't get it that money's being exchanged. And so it makes it all that much more difficult in this environment. And I think mm -hmm. taking these types of tests, to get a better understanding about yourself and then sharing these types of uh, examples with kids is certainly beneficial. I think so. And, and kids will pick up on your money script, even though you don't. Like my dad always had to have the newest car, right? But never saved any money. And I went the opposite way. So 
the observation is enough. Like your kids might know your money script before you do. So here are the steps I'm going to talk about. Know yourself. You'll understand them. The action steps to form the most important behavior, which we'll talk about. Conversation starters. Fun, engaging money activities. And then reading for parents and children. The, some of the books that I like uh, that I want to give you uh, some ideas of what to do. What can people do to get a much better understanding? And you, you talked about the money scripts, but yeah. how do they do it? Well, first of all, you can go to data points. Um, the millionaire next door uh, data points owns some part of money scripts. And um, you can go there and actually take the test or reach out to me uh, or go our website, take the wealth potential test. I'll see that you've taken it. I'll send you the money script test. But these, again, are learned in childhood. They're often unconscious passed down through generations and partial truth and but they are responsible for how we behave with money and the outcomes with money and your kids are going to start to exhibit these you'll see them i saw them with my daughter early i'm sure you see them with your kids really early on danny right if you bring them out and observe these quadrants you know sort of maybe your kids attitudes with money and how they would possibly fall into certain ones of these money scripts, but the way you're going to know what they are is you need to know your own and understand them. Very important. Well, that's right. Because I think there's good and bad that we all exhibit. And, um, you know, talking about a story, we, I let my middle son and all three of mine are so different with money. It's interesting to watch, but the middle one I will take to Walmart to buy a gift for siblings, like at Christmas time. And he is very intuitive and he's actually he's helping with math as well. But I say, all right, you have, you know, 20 bucks and he will go through and now granted 20 bucks doesn't get you a whole lot these days. I, I understand, but he'll go through and he'll pick out one thing. Well, okay, if I can get her this, I can only get him so much. And then he goes back and forth. And I think we spend so much time. So I give him plenty of time to do this that I think uh, there's, there's, there's people who probably want to come up and say, Hey man, you need some money. Let me, here's 20 bucks, you know? Go get, go get what you want because they think we're probably broke. But all these little things add up. And, you know, we talk about it being learned in childhood. I think that's a big deal as far as teaching them the value of it because they just don't see it. And then understanding, you know, how far it goes, it, it helps a lot. It does. It does. So you want to identify in your children the following money scripts. And what I've tried to do here is give you the name of the, you know, the, the type of money script, the signs in your children, and lessons, right? So money avoidance. These are the group that do not deserve, feel like don't deserve money. They feel guilty with the money they have. They suspect wealthy people are greedy or corrupt, and their virtue is in living with less money. So here's the signs in your kids. They vocalize negative thoughts about money. Oh, well, that person there, they got a lot of money. I don't like them or something along those lines. And if you're doing a basic save, share, spend exercise, they will allocate more to spend and share. They don't want to save it for themselves. They push it away. So here's the lesson. We want our children to be benevolent to a point, right? So you want to moderate, work with your kids to understand the benefits of personal financial security. Um, Instances of your own, like, you know, look, mom and dad, we went on this vacation and these are very expensive. We were able to do this because we saved for that. Or you're, you know, when we get older, you know, we won't be able to take care of you, but maybe we don't want you to take care of us. And we're building up money so that you don't have to do that. So, you know, you work through this money avoidance and make them try not to weaponize it. And I will tell you, Danny, not to get political, but it's tough today. Because there's this overarching theme of demonizing people who have work ethic or save. And, you know, you just see flares of that. And kids are picking up on some of that saying, well, that guy's got money. I heard someone say that the other day at a, at a restaurant. And I had to actually went over and corrected the child. I think the parents liked it very much. Um, how do you think your parents are affording this meal? Uh, so vocalize positive message about saving for a rainy day. How do you do it? Help them understand financial statements and terms. Like, do you know what a credit is? Uh, you, know, you know, again, you'll know it from your children, but I want you to pick up this sign 
of money avoiding and how money avoiders are. And I think the save share spend exercise, Danny, is really a one good way. But listening, like listening to this parent and the child saying, oh, well, that guy's got so much money. I don't think people should have that much money. Right. And the kid's not gnawing on a tomahawk bone. Like, okay, how'd your parents afford that? So, you know, there are signs. You're going to get the signs. Once you know the money script and you know the, how these work, you'll pick them up in your kids real fast or yourself. So, this is how we're going to flow this conversation. We're going to go through each of these scripts, give you the signs in your children, and then the lessons to go along with it. Anything to add to this one, Dan? Yeah, I always find it. Well, I always find it interesting because, you know, so many, I think it's easy to have money avoidance. It seems like at this day and age, but I think a part of it is social media gets people so jaded because they see all of these, uh, you know, false sense of actually what the real world is like, where they see all these people with these fancy cars and extravagant vacations. And that's not always the case of actually what's going on. I mean, you've seen this where you have influencers that go rent a plane or a vehicle just to take pictures and video and show people. And, this is where getting it back across the kitchen table, I think, is so important because then they understand that if you're you have money, it's for a well, reason because that. you plan for it, you save for like, it. Like, yeah. So maybe you see one of these TikTok influencers, and the kids are going, "Hey, look at all the stuff they have," and listen to the messaging around it. Well, they shouldn't have all that stuff. Uh, and then you can work through that conversation. Well, how do you think? Do they get it? Do you think? And what do you think they do with that money? Because what you want to do with money avoidance is show people that you want to be benevolent because your money could do good too. You just know that you could do good for yourself, your health. What about if you have family members who are ill? I had one parent that they had a child that definitely was in this money avoidance and they had to take care of his mother. And the mom was living alone. She's still able to do that, but she was living only on Social Security. So what he did, was he, he had his child's about, Bill's, Billy's, Bill's probably about nine or 10, sit across and he, he said, I wanna, show, I wanna show you, Bill, what I'm doing. And he wrote grandma a check for $17,000. And, and, and he goes, this is 17,000. I'm like, that's a lot of money, dad, that's a lot of money. I said, yeah, but grandma needs the money for food. <laughs> And other things. And he goes, Oh my gosh, you were able to help grandma. And he just, this kid's been more money avoiding. So he goes, Yeah. And you see, if you can able to take care of yourself, you could take care of people you love. So it's, so he's starting to see that, well, maybe money is not such a bad thing and maybe it can be used for good. But I had to absorb it and feel that it was good to have the security, but yet I'm able to pass some of this along to grandma. So, you know, again, this was a tough one. This one's a tough one to fight and you've got to work through it over time. It's like chiseling at a rock. Um, but I've had parents give some really creative ways of doing it and catching opportunities to embrace the money in a way that does good for them. But also the reason why I'm able to do good for others is because I have done good for myself and for you. And uh, that's how you want to look at it for money avoidance. So don't, don't give up, it's a challenge. But it, you got to work through the money avoidance one is one of the stickier, tougher ones that we need to work through. Yeah. So talk a little bit about money focus because this one's a little bit different. Yeah. It's listen. Hey, uh, money focus is I can never have enough money, right? It's the pursuit of money. Who's that guy? Kevin o, Kevin O'Leary, the dude on Shark Tank, right? Yep. You know, key to happiness is money. Money, money, money. So like. People were banging on him because he bought this watch. He bought like this one watch, like it's the only one made in the world. This 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 Swedish timepiece, and I mean, so people are like, and he's. But here's the thing: he puts on the watch and he starts crying. He starts crying over this watch, you know, and everybody is like, you know, social media is brutal, right? <laughs> and they're all like, "What are you crying about, dude?" You know, oh, my Timex does the same thing, right? So listen, there's a point where money, you know, not enough, all this money and status is, is so much for them, right? So they use purchases. The signs in your children is they're not happy until they make a purchase. Frankly, this watch was not that all that great, Danny. You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't even have liked it. I mean, it had all these mechanisms and all that. Like, 
I'm not a money focused guy. I took my money script. You remember we did it on the radio? This is like way low mm -hmm. on my, like, I don't believe like I need to impress anybody with money. It's just, and I don't impress myself with it. I don't need to make purchases to feel good. Um, so I'd rather make purchases for other people. That makes me feel good. But um, so this immediate yeah. gratification that you have to purchase. So if they're save, share, spend, what are they doing? They're allocating more money to spend. Like if you give them three quarters to put in the amount, and we're going to talk about how to use, how to do this safe share spend, if you don't do this, and they're putting all the quarters in spend, right? So, we, but here's the, here's the point. We want our children to enjoy to a point, but the detrimental effects of overspending, right? What's important? Relationships, experiences, saving for a rainy day arts and crafts, smaller things to get done. Um, teaching the dangers of excess credit and you can handle credit with fiscal restraint. And a lot of parents have examples of when they overdid it on credit cards and overspent and regretted it and share those, share those. And that, you know, it didn't really make me happy, right? There's a great book on money happiness that, that talks about media gratification versus delayed gratification. Um, but, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make is you'll know this. They get wrapped. Oh, man, I, this is me as a kid. And I think I got it from my dad, but this is me as a kid. Like I would see like the G.I. Joe on TV and I had to have it. Or I saw a brand of bacon or cereal and I had to have it. Right. It got to the point where my mother would take the cereal out of the generic box and put it into the into the fancy box of cereal because I was so brand conscious as a child. Uh, I had to reprogram myself to be away from that because my dad was so money focused. Um, so there's, and again, I think this one is probably pretty common, right, Danny? Because there's goods and services. There's a lot of goods in your face. Kids want stuff. They want to do certain things. So this one is probably the one that comes up mostly. What do you think? Yeah, this is one of the most difficult ones to not be, I think, in so many ways, because marketing and there's so many different avenues to attract people and to reach people at this day and age where, I mean, I can't tell you, I think a lot of people now, they have a, a separate email address for all the junk, right? You buy something, you've got to put your email address and well, guess what happens then? Then you just start getting inundated with additional marketing. And it's, there's always going to be somebody that has more. The issue with this is for many people, for most, and the reason they're money focused is it's fleeting, right? So you go get that immediate gratification and then it's gone. And then you're like, well, okay, this isn't so great. We're gonna talk about a couple of points to help you potentially avoid this as well, because this mm -hmm. is common amongst everybody. I don't care who oh, you yeah. are, there's oh, yeah. gonna be something that you think you need, you want, you have yep. to have, and you think it's gonna make you feel better. You're gonna, it's gonna improve your life by X amount. And then afterwards, a lot of times they find out like, oh man, okay, well, and then they move on to the next thing. And so it's, uh, it's the hamster wheel, right? It just keeps on turning. So this is it's one. A, well, that it's is, an endorphin, uh, right? It goes, it ignites mm -hmm. the endorphins in your brain to buy yes. stuff. I mean, it, it is a drug per se, and kids are loaded up. It's a gateway up on drug, it. right? Because you do it once, you keep going. Yeah, it's a gateway drug. It's, it's, yeah, sure. And it's tough, to, so, it's tough to stop. Yeah. So this is the one that is my dominant money script. Thankfully, as your advisor, any of my clients, <laughs> you want me to be this one. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to be surprised. Uh, alert, watchful, concerned about their finances, saving for the future. They believe in financial reward, right, to save um, higher levels of financial health, right? Um, signs in your children uh, could be, um, and I love this one. I could work through this one all day. My daughter had this one. Uh, anxiety before, when, or after they spend. And in a save, share, spend, everything went into save. Uh, she was totally extreme all the time. And in some ways she is, but we've sort of worn it down a little bit. Hey, do this. You've got the money to do this, Haley, do it. Okay. So you got to help kids understand balance. And listen, this is a great money vigilance problem is a great problem. This is the one you want your kids to have, but it, it is a point where it, might, it will make them unhappy right? So you got to understand balance, right? A fun money budget. Listen, we've got a certain amount of money out of your safe share spend. That is for you. 
that's something that you want, right? Help them, have them help with the budget for a fun experience. Like we're going to plan a family vacation. So this is a common one where you get the kids involved in researching hotels and what you're going to look at and why do I do this room over this room? So I find a lot of parents are using experiences and planning or getting the kids involved to help them understand how money can be fun and be used with constraints, right? And the value that comes with using credit wisely and responsibly, because you have a lot of, um, in money vigilance, won't use credit at all. Uh, everything's got to be paid in cash. Like we saw that with the with the silent generation, right? My grandparents work up through the depression. Credit would not have been something they would have used. But yet today, you got to have a credit score. And that is based on credit management and using cards, paying them, but being a overseer of your credit destiny. So this problem is a great one. <laughs> it's great if your kids have this money vigilance issue. But in a way, it could be overhyped and you're Scrooge McDuck. And you got to be teaching that balance. But man, I would rather come from this position <laughs> than the others. But yeah. it, is, it is also a problem if you're exceedingly money vigilant uh, and your kids are, and you'll know it through the safe share spend. So money status, money focus, I think they're, they're almost tied together in many ways, right? They are. They are. So this is the same kind of thing where... Um, it's, it's very, very similar, but let me explain to you what money status is. That is, I got to have everything to show off, right? This was my dad. My dad was money status, right? He made good money, but he never saved it. And it was always about appearances, man. He dressed like Elvis, right? He had all the great clothes and, you know, the watches. And he was like this, you know, in, in New York, he had this reputation of being like the best dressed guy right? Uh, all the clubs knew him, you know, very sharp. And that money status, that's where his happiness came from. And as he aged, it changed. It, it wore off. It wasn't as important anymore as the other money sources. So the same, almost the same lessons here with save, share, spend, still most of the money is going to go to spend. It's going to still be that way. And they're going to overspend and they're going to talk a lot to kids about other people and what they have, right? Oh my gosh, you know, Billy has got this new game and I've got to have it because if I don't have it, I don't fit in. That don't fit in because I don't have this thing is really good language for you to pick up on. And you got to step back and help the kids understand that, listen, money status, does, it, it, it can put you in financial jeopardy. Those people, if you read The Millionaire Next Door, the one thing you read, Danny, right? This is one of our favorite books we tell people a lot to, uh, to, to read. They don't really care what the Joneses are driving. They, they're not concerned with the status symbol of the car. You know, so I worked with a teenager not too long ago, and he goes, my kid wants this BMW. I'm like, N what? No. So we, and, <clears throat> you know, because all the kids at the school have these nice cars and all that. That's a tough one. Like, because kids still, I mean, maybe not as much today as maybe when we were kids, Danny, like kids, you know, you know, the car was everything. Now kids don't want to drive today. But this money status of what the money means to me, my self-esteem and how I appear to others can be really dangerous. Actually, Elvis had this. You ever see the new movie Elvis, right? There are points in times like Elvis, I think, died with like a million bucks. Like that was all he had or less than a million dollars, which is crazy, which are all the money he made. Gave a lot of it away, but he had to have the best of everything, right? He was totally money status. Um, so you want to make sure that your kids are not looking to do that and that, that money means more. It could even mean that you are helping them to understand the benefits of charity as well. So that's important. So money status. Uh, now, it's funny. When I did my money script, I don't, you probably don't remember this, Danny. My, my minor money script was this. And it sort of troubled me because I'm like, 
Maybe I do. Do I buy certain things because it's going to impress other people? I got to really look into that. Like, you know, so there are some things that are, you're going to have a less, and that comes over from my dad, I think. So, you know, the less you're going to have this dominant money script, like your kids are, and then you're going to have these minor, less important, but they're still there. And these are things that you want to clean up in your own. That goes back to the first tip know yourself, you'll know them. And that's why yeah. money status can be detrimental. This is also, I think, a tough one for kids today because they're trying to compete and be popular. And if the popular kids own a certain thing, then they want it too. Otherwise, they feel like they don't fit in. So, you know, this is a, this one is also a challenge. No, I see it now with young children. I mean, especially trying to you know, they think they need everything when, you know, trying to get them to differentiate between a need and a want is extremely important and giving them some, some tools to really understand that. And it, it's tough when you're really young. This is probably one of the most difficult, one of the scripts to, to avoid in, in general, right, with children, because they always want the nicest things, the, the coolest things, the, all the things that their friends have, and giving them something to work with and understanding how all this works. I'm not asking you to say, go out and talk about each one of these scripts with your children. But when you know that you can better acknowledge that it's like love languages, right? If you're, you're raising kids, you got to know their love language. Well, same thing goes with from finance, right? You got to know kind of where, where their pain points are good and bad. And you're going to do a much better job making sure to, you know, make them more well-rounded with this stuff. But yeah, this one's a tough one. I'm trying to think though of your minor money script on, money status. And I'm, I, I think I know you well enough. But I really can't pinpoint what that would be outside of maybe like your, your crazy Christmas suit or, uh, but, yeah, but I know you get that at like at the, at the bargain bin, right? I mean, Goodwill, yeah. where, where'd you get that stuff? Yeah, it was, it is. But the point is there is I a little it. bit of that, that yeah. I have that I got to be aware of. Right now, here's another thing you should keep in mind. You know, the way you can do it is you want to help kids to moderate, work with kids on understanding the detrimental effect of overspending. That's one thing. And also that also that saving for a rainy day, going back to experiences. Here's where, Danny, too, the way to week exercise works on a regular basis. In other words, do you still want this item? because this is still designed in immediate gratification. There's a core of that in here. So it's like something you just brought up earlier, right? Where you want something on Wednesday, the rule is wait till next Wednesday. Don't go out and buy it. Ponder it a bit, sit on it, right? This wait a week exercise can also help break the fever of money status. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a big, big one. We use that in our household. And even personally, that's one that has been kind of a, almost a gatekeeper or a guard with that speed, speed bump. Because after a week, I mean, even I find that most of the time I don't really need what I think I need, right? Or you find a better alternative or a cheaper alternative. Uh, way. Yes, that wait a week. And we're going to talk about the most important, um, the most important trait that we need to build, skill we need to build when it comes to this. So here's the delayed, this is really um, a real important behavior, delayed gratification. So there's this, and I remember in college learning about the Stanford Marshmallow experiment. experiment. Uh, Walter Mitchell did it in 72, but it was really offered a choice between one small but immediate reward or bigger rewards if they waited. And the reward was a mar marshmallow or a pretzel. Gosh, who knows what it would be today like uh, two video games and a, I don't know. So children who could wait and break those temptations became more self-reliant, uh, less distractible, cope with stress, um, do certain things to be more financially successful. Now, there have been a lot of studies that debunk this, but I still think when you read a lot of other books, uh, Daniel Kahneman wrote a lot of great books on this, that you know, that it's really important to bring or discover this delayed gratification in the kids. 
that turns out, even though the marshmallow experiment might be a little iffy, it's got some holes in it over time, the sentiment of it is really one of the most important behaviors. And think about your own money script. Think about your own financial behaviors. Why do you pay yourself first? Why do you save some money? Why do you budget? Because you understand the detrimental effect of too much immediate gratification. And that's, if you can shift the kids away from that and to this by being an example and also catching it in them by their money script, you've got a better chance of shape, reshaping um, their behavior and they'll become fiscally more responsible adults. So this, this is really important, but I wanted to give you some of the origins of this um, of this uh, component. I'm trying to think of the name. Why can't I not think of the Daniel Kamen book, Danny? Um, one of the best on this that I didn't put it in there because it's not really one of the books that would be for kids. Oh, Thinking Fast and Slow is the name of the book. Thinking Fast and Slow. One of the best books on waiting. That's a really good book right? Think fast, like the primal brain gets going, right? The think fast brain takes over and the think slow brain is the more critical thinker. Gosh, we need more thinker. We need, actually, I hate to say it, but we need more slow thinkers today, Danny, right? And, and that thinking fast and slow, Daniel Kamen is one of the best behavioral economic economists out there. So if you ever want to pick it up, you can get it in paperback. It's a great book. Uh, it's a heady read, take your time with it, but he goes through all these experiments, but that's sort of the spirit of this, delayed gratification. So we wanted to give you some practical exercises, and we're going to go through step by step. Wait a week test, save, share, spend, shift, the skin in the game, the wish list and action plan, the make the case document. These are all, I will tell you, from clients, things I've done, uh, Danny does these um, with his kids. These are, what we try to do is make these as original as possible. Uh, as best we can based on compared to what's out there. And maybe you can incorporate one or a few of these um, into your strategy with your kids. Yeah, I think the way to week test, that's always a great one to utilize. Um, we even use that as adults. Save, share, spend, yeah. I think when you start that at a young age. And if you notice in almost every slide, save, share, spend has been in it because mm -hmm. this is something yeah. so crucial and it, it's a lot easier to put this into action as they're getting an allowance or they get money for Christmas or their birthdays. Um, you know, they may, they may have a lemonade stand. Okay, guys, what do you want to do with this? Uh, mm -hmm. Get in the game. Um, you know, my kids want something. I, I love to provide for them. However, I don't want to just give them everything. I want them to have some skin in the game because number one, they appreciate it more. Number two, they take way better care of things. if They're just not given all this stuff. And so I think that that's a, that's a really good one to start enacting when they're young. Yeah. Because just like this, I mean, you hear stories and, and you and I visit with so many different people and, and different walks of life and different phases and skin in the game is huge, especially you hear about this often with college, Rich, kids that are actually putting some skin in the game with college historically, you know, not every time, but a lot of times they seem to have a much more vested interest in it and they do a much better job. So it may not be necessarily, it may be they're not paying for it, but they may be, uh, you have to have a job, you have to maintain certain types of grades. You have some parameters set around this. Um, yeah. Wish list, an action plan. I mean, I do this right now with the kids. In fact, we had a conversation last night surrounding a wish list. Like, what are your dreams? What do you want to be when you grow up? Or what do you want to do when you're playing these sports? What is, what's something you want to check off a list? Okay, here's, here's what you want to do. It's like, my son, little one, he wants to hit a home run over the fence. Great. What are you going to do right now to be able to achieve that? Well, you're going to have to work. And this is a great way to teach them these types of skills. And it's not necessarily every time it has to be with money, but it will add up to that because we always talk about Rome wasn't built in a day. You do it. It's one step at a time, putting one foot in front of the other. And then you get to see that bigger goal. And I think that's the other problem going back to social media. Nobody sees what's when tears of people who truly even been successful. There's a lot of hard work behind it. And that's the same thing with retirement, the same thing with savings. And if you can teach that at a young age, I think that's extremely important. And talk a little bit about make the case document. 
Well, the Mason Hayes document, Danny, so the, let me go through this. The skin of the game is real important. A client talks to me about this, even about lending money to adult children. Uh, you know, you have a lot of, say, for example, parents who are doing interfamily loans for mortgages for the kids. And he says, well, they have to have the down payment. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Skin in the game. Uh, the skin in the game of, uh, well, if you want this item, I'll match, right? This item is $15, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll match every dollar that you save from this, your allowance, your chores, whatever you're doing. So having that skin in the game as opposed to just getting it to your point, to make the case is why do you want this thing? Why do you want this experience? Why? Give me a reason. Give me the reasons why. Make your case for that new GI Joe. Mom, you know, it's got the new hair and the Kung Fu grip. You know, is that a good enough case to get a new one? I don't know, right? Then explain, well, I don't think that's a good, I don't think you made enough case because this one does pretty much the same thing. So just make the cases, you can detect whether or not your children really wants this item. And it also can divulge a little bit about their money script. Well, Joey's got this and it's, he's popular and that's what makes him popular. Wait a minute, not a good enough case, right? So. Why do you want this thing so bad? And some kids, they don't have a reason why. They saw it on TV. Not a good enough reason, right? So it's not like, okay, sure, you want that? Sure. And there are parents who do that too. Grandparents do that too, right? Uh, I, see that, I see that a lot with second marriages. And one parent's got stepchildren and he's, he or she has given them everything. And that's, no, make the case. Yeah. So that's, you that's see a lot some, with with divorce, right? Where one parent, one parent off might, than the other, and they try to provide a ton of extra stuff. I mean, I see that happen a lot where right. they go overboard with gifts and expensive purses or clothing or trips, and knowing that the other parent can't do that. Correct. It's almost a way that's spiteful, but it's also teaching them probably not the best behaviors along the way. Exactly. So these things, uh, the save, share, spend shift comes along with all those money scripts. When you're starting to talk to your kids, think about this. Well, gosh, Johnny used to put three quarters into spend, but now I see he's doing one quarter or two quarters into spend and, and one into save. That's an improvement. Recognize that improvement. Don't, let, don't poo poo it. Don't override it. Don't make it, make it a big deal. Wait a minute. Did you just put one quarter there? Can we, can we look to increase that? You know, make it a big deal if you see the shift you want in the save, share, spend overall. The wish list and action plan, to your point, Danny, is I want these things. How am I going to get them? You, you did a good, you know, as far as a goal. But if your kids want something or they want to go somewhere, they want to go. And there's all kinds of new stores opening up in use, new events, new things going on. You know, if you want to get there, well, what, what, how are we going to get there? It's joint. I'm not paying for everything. So these exercises, I think, Bill, and you got to do it over time, right? It's not once. You got to be an observer. You got to work on the wish list. You got to make, you got to be the judge, jury on the make the case. <laughs> you got to help your kids wait a week, put it on the calendar. Rich wants the new G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip. Who cares? When to next Wednesday, Rich? Let's talk about the Kung Fu grip. Uh, you know, so it's a little work. I'll admit, but this is, these are really important exercises. That's why they're exercises. They, you got to do them over time. Yep, absolutely. So the money conversation, everybody's like, oh my gosh, you know, I got to wait for like the very right time. Well, no, right? The imperfect, impromptu times are the best. You're on a shopping trip, you're on a vacation. Keep the money on your mind. Look for cues. Look for cues. I used to do that with my, my daughter all the time, watching how people buy certain things, uh, you know, watching her observation about things, looking how she contemplates one item over another when she wants it, like especially when we went through Disney, that was the greatest festival, let me tell you, because everything ends in a gift store. So 
her making these decisions and what she wanted and watching all these extras, like that is like the world series of money script and how your kids are going to react. Because you can't get out of the dark. Not just the kids, stuff. but you. Yeah, you can't because you want to also make your kids happy and get them stuff too. <laughs> and it, it was just amazing seeing my kid go like, oh, dad, this, this. I took her when she was like seven or eight. She goes, I mean, I was the one that was breaking the money script because I wanted her like, oh, dad, look, the sweatshirt with Mickey Mouse. It was 45 bucks. And I'm like, oh, honey, I'll buy it for you. And she goes, dad, that's just a lot of money. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Uh, she's the parent, right? So, yeah. Um, so there's no perfect time. At the grocery store, why do you buy one item over another? How do you compare prices? The, the pews are everywhere if you look, right? Items your children want. Budgeting for vacation. Explaining your own behavior. Reviewing your mistakes. There are more times to have the conversation than to not have the conversation because we are a consumer society. 70% of our growth, GDP growth is just us buying junk. So consumer spending is always there. There's a lesson in everything you guys are doing. And you just have to be step out, be more present and aware of, oh, this is a great conversation to have. I've had, I've had parents do this even when they're cleaning the house. Like, um, mom, why do you use that? You know, I just want to show you, I have this cleaner. And, uh, and the kid's like, what? Are you talking to me about like bleach? Yeah. This is why we do this. Certain things we do to keep the clothes, um, like washing cold, keeps some colors longer, saves money in the long run. I mean, I've had parents that have come up with conversations all the time about things you wouldn't even believe. Once you open your mind to it, you'll be, you'll be shocked by way, how and why you can create a conversation. Oh, there's so many, so many small things. Like 99% of the time, I iron my shirts, right? Mm -hmm. So kids will come in, you know, dad, why do you iron your shirt all the time? Well, number one, you, you explain the process and why. But <laughs> number two, you know, you could take this somewhere, but here's how much it costs. So yeah. You're wearing five different shirts throughout the work week and, you know, the weekend, you've got a couple more, it adds up quick. So they start to just small little things, everyday activities, you could do that. Now, I don't want to talk to them so much about it in some ways that they, they get a fear of it or they're just constantly, oh. but I always want them thinking about it, you thinking. know, and, and just instilling a little bit of behavior, just, okay, that makes sense. Well, I'll why you, like, do you do shopping, like I'll say, I usually... Yeah, why you do things like like why are you ironing your shirt? Yeah. and the you know and and then you don't have to have the lesson go any further than that really, like you don't have to continue it. Let them plant the seed. So go ahead with your other example. What were you going to say? Well, I mean, just just small things. I'll take them to the grocery store and like, oh my gosh, grocery bills expensive. Like, yeah, life's expensive, and here's why we shop the way we do. Just like you mentioned, right? Here's why you and I don't, I don't go into as far a detail. They probably see their mother making half the crap that she could buy uh, mm -hmm. at the store because she's trying to look for, for ways to save money. And it's just the small things every day. And you don't have to necessarily turn it into a specific conversation in the sense that where they feel like you're lecturing or talking to them. You're just having yeah. a, a quick conversation and just right. them, kind of filling them in and, and understand behaviors and why you're doing stuff. And it's just part of growing. Right. But that's that's an important aspect, I believe. You don't want to make it to your point. You don't want to make it a lecture because then people are like, oh, God, I'm going to lecture again. No, it's a flow. Here's why. By the way, what do you think? Get their feedback on it. Would you like, would you think you'd iron your own shirt? Yeah, it looks cool. I don't want to, you know, I want to give my kid an iron right now, burn the house down. But, um, I, you know. Yeah. To your point, you don't want to make it sound like you're telling them something or lecture like, well, here's what my, you know, you should do this because your mother never does it this way. Like you got, you know, the framing is really important when it comes to that. It's a drip, right? It's a drip process. These little money, little droplets that you're putting little thoughts in their head about things you do and why, and then let it go. Let their minds work on it. So listen, this can make it fun too. Like I have kids that do 
money notebooks, they have stickers on them, they track their spending, their chores, all in a little notebook, right? Favorite colors, charities they care about, right? Um, a lot of kids care about like um, the charities for the pets, right? They love animals, you know. All right, write it down, they keep track of it. Coins, like you said, we don't have money anymore, right? I tell people, don't rob a bank, you'll be disappointed when you walk into the vault, okay? Um, have kids touch, feel, accumulate physical money. Remember when we were kids, Danny, they used to sell the fake money? Like you go into the like the yeah. dime store and they would have the dollars and I don't even know if they sell that stuff anymore. I'm not sure. But, you know, but that's so that's important compared that to like credit cards and stuff. I mean, it's so important to make yeah. the money, even though it is virtual, make the money real, three-dimensional, even though they may not in real life use it as children. They want to touch those coins. I want a box and I want to put a quarter in save and I want to put a quarter in share and I want, I want them to go do the activities. I want them to shake it. I want them to like my kid would like, oh man, listen to my dad, listen to all the money I got. You know, you know, that, even though it sounds silly, at six, seven years old, that made sense to her. Because they're so visual and they, they're so into, you know, they, they touch those things. So Moonjar, great company, they have save, share, spend boxes. They're cardboard boxes. They're, you know, hexagonal kind of things. They also have them in more durable plastic. They're really neat. Uh, people create their own. They make their own. These electric coin banks, man, I, they have these banks. Like, you put the quarter in, you see like a, you know, like these new ones today, they're amazing. Like there's like, they have like timers on them. So like, you can't get the money out. I think those are great for kids that are, you know, money status and all that. Talk about delayed gratification. What's the code? But they have like these, 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 they're, they're almost like little computers, but you put the quarter in and it goes, thank you for your quarter. Over time, this will add up to blah, blah, blah. This way to return. I'm like, oh my God. So they have like these, bells and whistles if you want to go that far with it. And for some kids, that really fascinates them. Um, then there's large plastic jars decorated with stickers. Heck, you go to Hobby Lobby, Michael. I had Haley do that with a painted wooden box. He painted a wooden box um, green and pink. I still got it, actually. She probably doesn't even know I've got it in the garage. And, you know, she would put uh, uh, something around it, and then she would put her her money into it. And then I would go, okay, we're going to close it up, put it under the bed. I mean, these are unique storage ideas for actual touching and feeling of money. Yeah. yeah. M Michelle doesn't like to spend money. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were looking at mood jar years ago, right? And we've used these in the past and, and had clients use them. But she said, Danny, we're not going to buy, spend 20 bucks a kid and go buy one of these. So she made the initial ones. So they've got a little more sophisticated here. Let's that's a beige, but out of uh, toilet paper holders, yeah. like the cardboard. Yeah. And so there are ways you can do this for very cheap without spending a lot of money and just using resources you already have at hand um, is all I'm getting at. So it doesn't have to be something fancy, but the theme behind it needs to be similar. And understanding the save, share, spend aspect of it, I think, is, is just so important. Yeah, well, they sell plain wooden boxes, and you can glue them together, paint them different colors. Like, I think that yeah. that's... In some ways, that's a really better way, but you might get the idea from Moonjar. Because um, Moonjar yep. also has like the, the books where you can keep a running total of how much money you're spending almost like a, like a check register. And, but you can do that with a notebook. I would try to keep the electronics out of it as best I could. I understand about the electric coin money bank. Like I, when I was a kid, they used to have like a one that looked like a cash register and you press it and it opens and you put the money in, you close it, right? I mean, I understand you may not want to get as sophisticated as these electronic things, but some kids really, it does compel them to save more. I would go more toward what you're saying and make it overall like an arts and crafts and the arts and crafts, right? Fits into the money scripts. So I would try to, to make as much of this on my own, make it like a weekend project. And that's how I would do it. But these are really visual, fun ways and having kids touch the money. And I have, I have one family that will collect coins now, um, you know, like finding old pennies and looking at the date. 
and and doing coin collecting. It's not because they're going to be big, you know, coin collectors. It's just that they're they're using that to save the money, and they're looking at all the different coins that they find on the beach. Uh, one bought a little metal detector thing, and they find like I think it's one quarter from like 1920 or something. <laughs> it's pretty fascinating. So the touch is important. The Rich Dad's Cash Flow for Kids boards game. This is a, kids are like 10, 9, 10, 11, 12. This is a great game. Um, I still have mine with Haley's. Um, and, but it really helped un understand assets and liabilities. Um, and it, it's pretty cool. And it also helps them understand how to like create income cash flow, like how to build income over time. You know, because obviously Rich Dad uh, cash flow for board, you know, Rich Dad is always about the, real estate, right? So it's just a strategy of assets and liabilities, but I, I, kids need to be a little bit older. Um, Buy It Right is really cool game for kids that are six plus. It's a shopping game. They set prices for their goods. They learn how to make change. Very basic, really like it. Then there's this managing my allowance. It's a family friendly game for two, you know, two more players, age eight and up. It uses paper bills and coins. It's a great option for kids for practical tasks through books. So these are very basic games, but if you go to Amazon or Etsy, uh, wherever you want to go and find these kinds of games, uh, they're out there. Heck, you remember, I don't know if you ever played this game as a kid, but the game of life? Yes. Yes, right? Like along the way, you're collecting the family and the allowance and the job. And I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I think like, I think it happened during the pandemic, but there was this resurgence to board games. I don't know if they're, if we've, we've, we've thrown those out the window yet, but I still think they're pretty cool. No. And, and you well, know, it's probably why everybody's choosing not to have children because they have a lot more money. Uh, there are a I lot know. out there. I just giving you my favorites. I don't want to inundate yeah, you yeah. with stuff. So, and then there's. What this, about books, Rich? So a couple of yeah, good books so, to read. Yeah, this is a cool one, this Golden Quest. It's like Calvin and Hobbes, Rich Dad, Poor Dad meets Calvin and Hobbes. And it's about this, you know, this boy and his dog. And they go through all these golden rules of money, compounding, all the basic stuff you want to help. It's really, really neat. And then if you had a million, right? This is a great visual, right? How to explain earning money, investing it, dividends and interest, watching savings grow. What would you do? Right. And the funniest part is, you know, when I'm on the radio show and I say like one of the best investments you can make is a lottery ticket and everybody cringes at me and I get nasty emails. <laughs> you're a financial planner and you're talking about buying lottery tickets. I'm like, okay, listen to me. I buy a $2 scratch off. Okay. I buy a $2 scratch off. And before I even scratch, which is also very satisfying, um, I've got all in my head what I would do with the money. Like it, it's, it's like this imagination overload. Like it's the most entertainment I have in a long time for $2. And then I don't do it again. So I'm saying is this, if you made a million and gives, it goes through this process and then it gets to that million, then you can have the conversation. Now, what would you do with it? Because you know the kids' money scripts. What would you do? Let's talk about it. If you had a million dollars, what would you do? Because the kids, a million dollars is still a lot of money. Heck, to a lot of adults, it's still a lot of money. So these are some ideas on recommended reading. And then we, again, like I had mentioned, we have the Millionaire Next Door Quiz, which you can get at Real Investment Advice, which will take you to the financial uh, guide. You get a personality report. The exercise is about eight minutes to complete. This wealth potential quiz is very cool. A lot of teenage kids could teach it. A young adult kids really helps out with helping them understand their potential to building wealth, right? Very, very important. Um, once you take the quiz, I can see it. Or, and then I can move you on to the money script test. Send you the link. No one's going to try to sell you anything or anything. So don't worry about that. The money script's a really nice report. You don't pay for it, but it'll give you an idea of what your money script is. And uh, that'll take you know longer, about 16 minutes to go through. So, uh, and again, you can have this, do this wealth potential test. I've had kids that are 17. Like they're 16, 17, they're starting their, own, their, their new job. And I've had some of the parents, Danny, take the uh, wealth potential, millionaire next door test, 
and go through it with them to see what their score is. And they get real excited about it because that is still one of the best books. I'm going to be ad nauseum about it out there. Um, so I've worked with Sarah Fallow. Um, Dr. Fallow is the daughter of the original writer of Millionaire Next Door. And uh, she's great. And we've worked together on a lot of this. And um, to get it on our website, and uh, it's, it's really fascinating. But there are multiple quizzes that you can take. And I will tell you, Danny, it's been pretty successful. We've had, I want to say about 100 people already have taken the test. And it's not even that easy to find on the website yet. So uh, great yeah. for your younger, you know, your young adults, older mm -hmm. teens as well. Yeah, I think any of these tools, I mean, you don't have to use all of them, but using one or two of them, and then hopefully today, you're just really getting more awareness around how to speak to children about this, bringing up these timely topics. And it doesn't have to be a, a formal discussion. Yeah. I think those are good in understanding yeah. finances and bringing them in. And, and, and one thing I'll share, we work with all different types of people, but the most successful families, and I'm talking about some of the, the people who are creating generational wealth, if, if we're looking at it from a wealth perspective, they almost always have their children involved, mm -hmm. always, because yep. they're trying to make sure that they have a very good understanding as far as how the inner workings of, of things work. What are the, the discussions that you're having? Um, what are the different types of uh, considerations that you have to make surrounding money? And so I think it's really important. You don't even have to talk about dollar number, you know, the dollars per se, the amounts, but bringing people in, and having them engaged is so super important. And so I think bringing those the tips of, you know, just in daily activities throughout life, things that you're doing already, I think that's really important. But taking this personality test, I think, from a money perspective is awfully good because you get a better understanding on yourself and you can share that with the kids and then hopefully steer them in the right direction as well. And you'll pick up on all these personality traits over time. Um, oh, but well, you bring up a good pretty point cool. though, Danny. There has been this and it's a lot better but growing up in an Italian family, this money shadow, like you never talk about money. You were never allowed to yeah. talk about it. And if I even, when my dad was dying and I would ask him about, dad, now do you want to talk about like, even though you don't have any money, but things I need to know. And um, no, you're my kid. What do you need to know? You're a stupid kid, right? I was 28. But I mean, it's, um, it's different now. Yeah. Those barriers are coming down. And to your point, the families who are talking to their kids along the way, like my daughter, she knows exactly how much she has in a 529. We talk about the investments in there. And then I talked to her about the new Secure Act provision in 2024 that, that we can go ahead and maybe roll some of this money she's not using into a Roth for her. She's very excited. Talk about it. Talk about it. Now I find a lot of younger um married couples come in together very nice to see both parties engage talking mm -hmm. about money uh so important so you're right get out of the money shadow and if you've made mistakes with yeah. money it is okay your kids don't need to know you're perfect they need to know how you overcame it over time as they get older dad you built up a lot of credit yeah Oof. you know but here's how I got out of it, and here's a lesson for you. And you know, it's not a lecture, but you know, you're not perfect. Make your help your kids understand that. I made oh, I bought this company stock once. This stock was terrible. Somebody told me about the tip, and I bought it. I mean, just make it comfortable. Make it part of your process with your kids. Then when they get older, they'll call you. Hey, Dad, I got some extra cash. Where should I put it? I know I'm just researching high yield savings. This is the you know, once they're in their 20s and they have these conversations and they're building balances, it's all because you, you made an open, friendly, warm environment about discussing money. Speaking of money, here we are. We're fiduciaries here to help you, right? People who we know. Hey, Danny, do we have any questions? I know everybody's here on their lunch. Do we have any questions we need to address from anybody? Does anybody have any questions on the chat? Or Yeah, we, we no, we, we do have a couple of questions. So, uh, one question was, um, what are some funds, ETFs that we'd suggest for a recent college graduate with no debt? And I think before we jump into funds, and Rich will likely agree, we want to talk about the hierarchy of, of savings. Hierarchy. Where, where are you putting stuff? Yeah, and, and this, is, this is really important for somebody starting out. And so obviously, you know, usually the, the first thing that most people will go to is the, the 401k, right? Um, 
Then it's, do you invest in the traditional or the Roth? Many people don't even understand or, or realize they have the Roth because it's just not typically put out there. But mm-hmm. we want to make sure we get a match. But in the interim, we also want to make sure that we're fortifying our household by creating a savings, making sure we have emergency funds, expenses, uh, you know, understanding exactly what that looks like. Do we want three months of expenses? Do we want six months? Do you need 12? Uh, and I know this, the number sounds extremely lofty, but over time, I think this is a great way that you can start to have these conversations. So we want to look at savings. So for expenses, emergency funds, so to speak, Rich and I will also talk sure. about financial vulnerability cushions in the event that larger, bigger events occur within life, HSAs, and then start dipping into, okay, where do you put funds, right? Like in yeah, addition to this to right. invest. Yeah, because what you're saying is, keep in mind, you they can they can purchase a plain vanilla Vanguard index ETF. But here's the most important thing. I'm just getting, I'm a young person. I'm just getting out of school. I don't even know what I'm doing. Um, I don't have an emergency reserve. I may get a package at work. Um, maybe that's how I do it. Because what if I buy it in today's market and I need the money like in a year because I, I have, I'm, I got a new apartment or I need a cool car, I want to buy a house. And then all of a sudden you're down 15% and I never invest again. So the investments, I will tell you, they're the cherry and the icing on the cake. We got to bake the cake first. We got to help the kids mix the formula. And that goes with, okay, you got a savings account? No? First step. Second step, you got a package in from your employer, your new employer. Are you maximizing those benefits? Are you looking at your Roth 401k? There is where you're going to make those investments. And that's the money where I want the money to grow long-term because today they make the ability to tap this money, these retirement accounts for almost anything. Buy a new house. You know, I've got my foot hurts and I need to get this. Whatever it is, we have more leakage in these accounts because we haven't taught that you don't put all your money away into these longer term investments. Because if you're gonna put your, if you're, if you're a young adult who's gonna put money into an index fund, it's going to have, should, need, should sit there for 10 years. Is that money that they're realistically at the start of their life gonna put away and not touch for 10 years? And most likely not, unless they have done all these other steps first. Very important. Otherwise, they can just look at a plain old Vanguard total stock market index fund. Not a problem. If they've got all their other ducks so, in the right. All right, two more questions. Um, explain, elaborate a little bit on the 25 cent coin placement in three buckets. That's the save, share, spend strategy. Yeah. So, well, when I was first doing this with my daughter, they have, you know, it's just a box, right? And it gives you save, share, spend. And then money would gather in those channels and then you would use them, right? Um, things I want to buy, things I want to, I, want to, I want to keep saving, right? And then I would take them out of the box and save and I would put them in her other box and it would grow and she would shake it, right? So you want to know, the reason you want to do that is you want to know how the kids are allocating, right? I know if I have a kid that's putting all their money into one of those channels, Three quarters that I give them because I because you got to start. Here's three quarters. Here's what save is. Here's what share is. Here's what spend is. Let them do it. See how they do it. And a lot of kids are going to put it all in, in spend. There's your learning opportunity. Take it out. <laughs> okay, honey, we're going to do this again. Let's talk about why we're going to do it different here. And then okay, so see where your kid starts out first. It's a good question when you think about it because. It gets into the, 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 the DNA of why you're doing it. It's to not watch the behavior and shift the behavior based on where that money is going. And you might say, well, what's, what's perfect? It doesn't have to be perfect. Just watch the trend. If it's one week, it's all saved. Next week, it's all share. Next, it's okay. Watch the trend of that money and those three quarters. Then we used to go up to, yeah, and, and Haley I, I and I, we went up to $3. We would put $2 in there, right? And then we needed bigger boxes. Um, but there was a point I would tell, gosh, Dave, Haley, you're saving a lot. Like, we've had three weeks of save. Um, is there anything you want? No, Dad, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this. Oh, so that's a wish list. Yeah, I think I want these uh, pound puppies. She used to love those. Okay, 
and it's it's uh, nine dollars. And you know, okay, or you want a pound puppy? Why? Make the case. Well, because I, you know, and I know I'm gonna do this. I'm, okay, pound puppy. But she made the case enough for me. I was a judge and jury, and I gave her this. So you know, it's a little work. To save, share, and spend is a spark, right? It's it's a way for you to watch behavior, shift behavior, build on behavior, realize results of the behavior, right? There's a lot to that save, share, spend than maybe we went into in this conversation because everybody's trying to have lunch and, and move on. No, but I think it's important. Uh, one last thing on that topic is to, to make sure you explain what you're, what you're doing with each one of these buckets, so to speak. You know, the yeah. chair, what does that really mean? Is that tithing to the church? Is it a charity? Is it um, you know, it's not just necessarily sharing with your friends, making them understand, you know, where these funds are going and why you're doing this. Um, I'll, sorry, I'll give you an example, going. Danny, not to, to not to interrupt you. I'll give you one example. But at the end of the year, what Haley yep. and I would do, first week of December, we would take all this share and we would go to Walmart. And we would buy dog food, cat food, and then go to the Montgomery County Animal Shelter and drop it off. That was how she wanted to do it. And I was okay with that. So that's where yeah. her money was. But yours might be Red Cross or, you know, like you said, could be something at the church. Um, for her, it was always the animals. So we built it up and then we made a big deal out of it. Like, you know, oh gosh, it's Walmart day. And then I also would match it, right? Okay, now you did such a great job. You saved $75 for share. I'm gonna match you $75. And oh, dad would get more food for the cats and dogs and some toys. Yeah. And then we go and deliver it. Most likely come back with a dog. But we, you know, make it your own process. Next question. Do you recommend a secure credit card for teens? Is it helpful for helpful for building credit or bad for developing a credit card habit? I think this depends on how you do it. So and how you and how you discuss secure, it. After. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Correct. So so a secured card is essentially you're going to put down a hundred bucks, they're going to have a card that that's going to be able to work off of that hundred dollars. Right. And I'm just using this for an easy example. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the kicker here is, so it doesn't develop into a habit where a credit card, you're not spending your money per se, but when you have a secured credit card, you are helping them build, um, you know, a habit that can actually be good if you're having these discussions around it. Look, the, the days are gone of balancing a checkbook in front of children, right? We're, nobody hardly uses checks anymore. So this could be a great tool where you actually balance this credit card and come back to it and understand how do you set parameters? Okay, you're doing a really good job. You saved some extra money. Let's go ahead and increase this secured credit card a bit. And this is kind of a, a credit card on training wheels. So I'm all for it, but I do still think you need that adult supervision overseeing it. Well, don't you think like a lot of these things we talk to is a way you can apply that? Like, what did you spend the money on? Make the case. In other words, I still think you got to go through that process. Because I did this with Haley. I got her a secure card. She used it. We went through all the money she spent. And then she went on to a real a card, a real card, very young, but it was a, um, it had a very low limit, you know, when we started talking about credit scores and all that. So to your point, um, you got to go through some of these same steps. Just don't get the card and let them spend up to the limit and then keep doing that. There's a lesson in all of that and going through the spending. There's a lot of work, but it's worth it because you're teaching them the value of credit and how dangerous, how a double-edged sword of credit, right? Remember how, how wealthy people do it? Wealthy people use leverage. They are smart with credit. They will use credit to their advantage. Now with rates going up, that's changing a little bit, but when rates were low, boy, people who were smart with credit and leverage were doing a great job of it, right? Yeah. So they respect it at the same time. They respect it. So you're helping to build a respect for credit. But, but I've had one family that did this and they would put $100 and the kid would just go in and spend the money. And then they would fill in it every few, day, every few months. I'm like, wait a minute. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> this is not the point of this exercise. Oh, I got $100 to spend. No. No. So yes, it's a great idea, but don't forget the lessons that go along with it. Don't forget that. So last question real quick. Uh, Brent addressed this on the Q&A, but 
Any recommendations on books or resources to help college-age kids explaining real-world stuff like paying rent, credit cards, buying first car, mortgages, 401ks, a new job, insurance, et cetera? Brent recommended the, the Millionaire Next Door, and I agree. That's a great book. Really covers the foundation. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Rich? I think the process of that strategy of how, like setting rules of how much for rent, what those, you know, I think the millionaire next door is a really good step. Also the wealthy barber. Um, that's a really good book for yeah, investing that's a good one. over time. Um, there is also like, I would invest in a budget book um, and, and go through that process. Um, budgeting is underrated and it's, it's over glamorized is nothing in the middle. In other words, I use all these electronics or I don't do anything here. You know, knowing where your money is going, paying yourself first, so important. Um, so uh, we should um, think about putting together the savings hierarchy um, and having that as a guide for everybody. Really good way to start out money management tips and budgeting. I think her name is Arlene Klein. Um, that's a good one. Listen, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Dave Ramsey when it comes to investing, but Dave Ramsey does a really good job of helping kids understand like the money basics, like a financial fitness class, maybe offered through your church. Uh, you know, Dave Ramsey does a really good job with that structure. Terrible investor. Yep. Terrible when it comes to insurance even though he yells at people on TikTok who believe that about him. Um, getting very ornery. He's getting like Howard Stern sometimes. But that also is a, a big help. There's also one book out there that came out last year. Um, it's called How to Adult. And it's called Personal Finance for the Real World. Um, I got a copy of this book and I thought it was pretty good. It's by Jake Cousineau, C-O-U-I-S. C O U S I N E A U. And that's just going to, it's pretty, it's good for a high school graduate, college student, any young adult that has to prepare for adulthood. It goes to like compound interest, Roth IRA, how to budget, save, and invest, taxes and insurance, how to prepare for life's big expenses. So that's not, that's. That's a pretty decent um, book as well. We really appreciate you guys joining us. Um, you can check us out on YouTube, The Real Investment Show. If you're not a subscriber, please go subscribe. Um, and then share this with people. If this is something that you found that you took a couple bits and pieces that you, you can use in your household or, or with family, um, please share this with them. And let us know how we can help you guys. We appreciate you spending so much time with us today. And, uh, and also, we'll be back at it here before you know it. Yeah. So please, to, to Danny's point, share it with your uh, adult kids, young kids. Hope they get a lot from it. If they have questions, of course, reach out to us. We're happy to help. All right, guys. Thank you all. Everybody have a great week.